Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the campus of George Washington University in downtown Washington, D.C., for what promises to be a very remarkable afternoon. My name's John Logston. I'm the director of the Space Policy Institute here at GW's Elliott School of International Affairs. We're uh, a very happy co-host, along with Lockheed Martin and NASA, of this afternoon's uh, lecture by uh, uh, Professor Stephen and Lucy Hawking, uh, which promises to be uh, uh, something that will be special. Uh, Professor Hawking has prepared a brand new lecture. This is its first uh, showing or talking this afternoon, and, and uh, I think that's remarkable. My job is to quickly get out of the way by introducing, uh, for a, a formal welcome, the 16th president of George Washington University, Dr. Stephen Knapp. Dr. Knapp. Thank you very much, Professor Logston. On behalf of the Board of Trustees and the faculty of the George Washington University, it's a pleasure to welcome you all this afternoon to the third lecture in a series celebrating the 50th anniversary of NASA. I'd like to thank the event's sponsors, Lockheed Martin and NASA, for choosing the George Washington University as a venue for this important event. And I'd particularly like to uh, uh, acknowledge the presence here of uh, Shannon Dale, who is the Deputy Administrator of NASA, who's here with us today. And it's a pleasure to be sitting here also with Lucy Hawking in the front of the theater. Time does not permit me to acknowledge uh, all the distinguished members of today's audience but you are all welcome for what I know will be a very exciting and stimulating lecture. GW has worked closely with NASA for most of the agency's existence. NASA's second administrator, in fact, James E. Webb, studied law at GW in the 1930s and was a member of the GW Board of Trustees from 1951 to 1963. As NASA administrator, Webb in 1964 asked GW to turn its attention to the policy implications of the US space program, and for the more than 40 years since then, GW has made space policy a focus of its research and its graduate education efforts. We established the Space Policy Institute in 1987 as part of the Elliott School of International Affairs, and that institute has become the leading center of space policy studies in the world. Much of the institute's research and outreach activities has been supported by NASA grants and contracts and we appreciate NASA's confidence in the quality of the Space Institute's work. We also appreciate the continuing support that Lockheed Martin has provided to the Space Policy Institute from its very inception. The Institute's focus on space policy is typical of the innovative character of GW's Elliott School of International Affairs. One of the nation's leading schools of international affairs, the Elliott School seeks to create knowledge, share wisdom, and inspire action to address gl global challenges. My role is not to introduce Professor Hawking. That honor falls to Ambassador Richard M. Russell, Associate Director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the Executive Office of the President. I will note only that Professor Hawking's pioneering mind is one of the greatest of our era and that he has combined profound insights into the nature of the universe with an admirable commitment to making those insights available to the general public. It is a privilege as well as an honor to have him on our campus. It's now my pleasure to introduce Ambassador Russell, who serves both as Associate Director of the OSTP and as Deputy Director for Technology. Mr. Russell was nominated by the President and confirmed by the Senate in August 2002. He served as President Bush's Ambassador to the 2007 World Radio Communication Conference. He first joined OSTP as Chief of Staff in 2001, following a decade of service on Capitol Hill where he worked on science and technology issues in both houses of Congress. Ambassador Russell. Thank you, Dr. Knapp. Uh, it is truly an honor and a pleasure to introduce the speakers for the third in the series of NASA lectures that celebrates NASA's 50th anniversary year. These lectures are a unique opportunity for prominent leaders to address matters of global interest in the areas of space, exploration, scientific discovery, aeronautics, research, to audiences of key policymakers, corporate leaders, academics, and the public sector. I would also like to acknowledge Shanna Dale, the Deputy Administrator of NASA, for establishing this series. And uh, it really uh, is going to be a treat this afternoon 
to listen to Professor Hawking and uh, Lucy Hawking. Today, we have a unique father-daughter pair with us. Not much to be, needs to be said about Professor Stephen Hawking, who is one of the world's foremost cosmologists and astrophysicists. Since 1979, he has been the Lucian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge University, a seat once held by Sir Isaac Newton. I'm actually a stand-in for the President's Science Advisor, Dr. John Marburger, who unfortunately has the flu today, but he wanted me to recount a story to you about how important Professor Hawking's work is in terms of being able to translate science uh, into something that's understandable for the public. Dr. Marburger used to be the head of the Brookhaven National Laboratory, and while he was there, they attempted to start up the relativistic heavy ion collider, also known as RIC. That caused a lawsuit. There was a claim that if Rick was turned on, we would create a black hole and it would eat the world. <laughs> now, that may sound funny, but unfortunately, the public actually believed that a black hole might be created. And um, uh, Professor, and uh, at that point, uh, Director of the National Laboratory, Marburger, turned to Professor Hawking and asked for advice and asked for him to give advice to the press. And it is because of his advice that we should not worry about being consumed by a black hole if the collider was turned on, that it allowed Brookhaven to move forward with the collider. So Dr. Marburger wanted to uh, both express his sadness at not being here today, but also his um, pleasure and thanks for the wonderful work that uh, Professor Hawkins has done, not only in terms of um, uh, an understanding of physics, but also in terms of being able to rate, relate to the general public directly uh, and um, move science forward. Professor Hawking's lecture, which is titled Why We Should Go Into Space, was written especially for this event, and he considers it a 50th birthday present for NASA, and quite a birthday present I'm sure it will be. His daughter Lucy is a journalist and author. Lucy and her father have co-authored a book for children called George's Secret Key to the Universe, which was published in October, and there's a second book on the way. Professor Hawking will initially speak for a few minutes, followed by Lucy, and then uh, Professor Hawking will complete his lecture. And with that, I would like to uh, introduce and welcome Professor Hawking and Lucy. Thank you all so much. go into space. What is the justification for spending all that effort and money on getting a few lumps of moon rock? Aren't there better causes here on Earth? In a way, the situation is like that in Europe before 1492. People might well have argued that it was a waste of money to send Columbus on a wild goose chase. Yet the discovery of the new world made a profound difference to the old. Just think, we wouldn't have had the Big Mac or KFC. Spreading out into space will have an even greater effect. It will completely change the future of the human race and maybe determine whether we have any future at all. It won't solve any of our immediate problems on planet Earth, but it will give us a new perspective on them and cause us to look outwards rather than inwards. Hopefully, it would unite us to face a common challenge. This would be a long-term strategy, and by long-term, I mean hundreds or even thousands of years. <laughs> <laughs> 